Postmillennialism, what is it? Postmillennialism teaches that Christ will return at the end of a future golden age called the millennium. And this golden age will come in a gradual, less violent way with Christians converting and reforming society into a near perfect social and political state. This view puts great emphasis on completing the Great Commission recorded in Matthew chapter 28. Most historians agree that the first theologian to systemize the historical fragments of post-millennial eschatology into a cohesive theory was Daniel Whitby, rector of St. Edmund's Church in Salisbury, England in 1703. The source of his theory was his work entitled A Paraphrase and Commentary on the New Testament. Daniel Whitby was a proto-Unitarian who lived through much of the horrid bloodshed of the English Civil Wars. He witnessed the madness of millennium fever gone to the extreme. The bloody violence and death caused by millennial extremism in the 17th century soured the people of England on antichrist chasing. The 18th century dawned with the populace of England seeking for a new way to interpret changing times and seasons. The supernatural worldview caused by extreme millennialism no longer satisfied. into the gap stepped the philosophical age of reason that challenged the purpose for God. The three main rationalists who challenged the supernatural worldview were René Descartes, Barack Spinoza, and Gottfried Leibniz. These rationalists sought to reinterpret world events and natural disasters through a scientific explanation. The challenges coming from the age of reason caused the apocalyptic worldview to fall into decline. According to this worldview, society was getting better because it was stepping out of the darkness of religious superstition into the light of human reason. Daniel Whitby used portions of this rationale to formulate his new eschatology. He envisioned Christianity stepping into the light and evangelizing the world, thus bringing about a new golden age of peace and prosperity. According to Whitby, the future of the world was bright because Christianity would change the hearts of men. He also taught that Jesus Christ would come back to inherit a society perfected by the hard work of Christian men and women. Whitby's post-millennialism caught on because life was gradually getting better and the people wanted to believe in a brighter future. Was society getting better? Some may argue this point, but generally, yes, society was getting better. The 18th century witnessed the bright dawn of the Industrial Revolution with the general improvement in the quality of life. Something strange happened with postmillennialism during the 18th century. Portions of this doctrine made the jump into the secular worldview. The philosophers of the Enlightenment also envisioned a coming golden age where society would mature and come of age. The fruit of this seed would not come to light for another 200 years in the tumultuous 20th century. The 17th century was also the era of the colonialization of America. The early American colonies became a microcosm of the religious and spiritual issues that confronted Europe and England. All but one of the 13 English colonies had Protestant beginnings. 
The first English colonists who came to American shores were Congregational Puritans and Anglicans. But in a short time, Presbyterians came from Scotland and Ireland, Mennonites came from Switzerland, Quakers from England, Lutherans and Moravians came from Germany, and Dutch Reform came from Holland. Each of these groups brought with them their own radical Millennium views. The Millennium Fever of Europe found fertile soil in America. Many of these new colonists were radical Puritans who brought with them a unique form of premillennial thinking. They believed the second coming of Jesus Christ would initiate the millennium. Probably the most famous of the premillennial colonists were Increase Mather and Samuel Sewell. These men argued that the infection of the Papist Antichrist was everywhere. In contrast, postmillennialism also came with colonists from England, and their rosy picture of the millennium would receive confirmation in a spiritual revival called the First Great Awakening. Europe, during the 17th century, was infected with a religious apathy caused by the horror of the Thirty Years' War between Protestants and Catholics. This apathy migrated to American shores by frustrated colonists. In 1729, a Boston preacher described the apathy over the world as such. Alas, as though nothing but the most amazing thunders and lightnings and the most terrible earthquakes could awaken us. We are, at this time, fallen into as dead a sleep as ever. Sincere Christians in England yearned for more than the apathetic liturgy that plagued the typical Protestant churches. The people hungered for the inner fire of the Holy Spirit. On the scene came John and Charles Wesley in the 18th century, who preached about a new kind of faith and relationship with Jesus. The hard work of these evangelists produced the Methodist revival that fired the hearts of the English people with a new, renewed faith. Almost simultaneously, in the American colonies, Jonathan Edwards preached a similar doctrine in the New England colonies, and the first fires of revival came to his church in Northampton, Massachusetts. Shortly, he was joined by George Whitfield, and the American colonies came alive with the revival that became known as the First Great Awakening. We now had the Methodist revival burning in Europe and the wildfire of the Great Awakening burning in colonial America. Tens of thousands of conversions were experienced during the glory days of these revivals. Jonathan Edwards is seen as the greatest theological mind of colonial America, and he was decidedly a post-millennialist. He saw the Great Awakening as a prelude to the millennium. He preached that these revivals would gradually convert America, setting the stage for the millennium to come by the year 2000. Jonathan Edwards believed the Great Awakening would not end. But to his dismay, the revival did end, and the New Age did not begin. Edward's disappointment did not frustrate the spread of postmillennialism. The vision for America was bright and our destiny was linked to the divine master plan of God. The 19th century dawns and the smoldering embers of the first great awakening spring to life again and the second great awakening sweeps across America. 
the arrival of this new movement of the Holy Spirit also reinvigorated post-millennial excitement. But the core beliefs of colonial post-millennialism morphed to include social and political activism. Abolitionism, the temperance movements, and women's rights are classic examples of the post-millennial activism produced by the Second Great Awakening. Probably the greatest preacher of the Second Great Awakening was Charles Finney, who strongly believed that Christian revivals and social activism would change America and bring about the millennium. He said, If the church will do her duty, the millennium may come in this country in three years. Finney also adamantly insisted that the greatest threat to this new wave of revivalism and activism was the darkened beliefs found in premillennialism. The Second Great Awakening produced a splinter group in 1848 that was called the Perfectionists. This community was founded in Oneida, New York by John Humphrey Noyes that believed in a new social order where communal marriage was practiced and housing, work, and finances were communally operated and shared. They also believed that total, complete spiritual perfection could be attained in their communal society. Historical records show that this group had strong post-millennial beliefs. All was going well with post-millennialism in America. Out of this belief system came a new political doctrine and direction called Manifest Destiny. One event came along that frustrated post-millennial hopes and dreams. That event was the Civil War and 620,000 dead. One might think that post-millennialism dominated 18th and 19th century America. But this theory was not alone. Premillennialism was lurking in the shadows and pastors like Increase and Cotton Mather kept it alive. 